So in the, the, the hospitality industry, uh, there, there is a, a phrase, a, a saying that you may have heard before. I don't know. I, I had heard it. I just didn't know where it came from. It goes like this. It says, the answer is yes. Now what's the question? And on the surface, it's pretty clear what that means, especially in the context of retail or customer service. What it means is that if you're truly committed to someone's best, you want to serve them no matter what, then the answer is yes. Rather than saying no, or even, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do to help you, you find a way for the answer to be yes. Then it's a matter of saying, okay, now what's the question? One company in particular tried to embody that, uh, that idea. And in a 2015 article in Forbes, Micah Solomon told a story that encapsulates this idea kind of beyond belief. Uh, a, a couple had arrived at a luxury hotel to spend their anniversary, to, to, for a weekend celebration of their wedding anniversary. L listen to the, the way he describes what happens. It says, as the staff unloaded the luggage, our female guest said to her husband, don't forget my hanging bag. Her husband looked into the trunk and came up with a horrified expression on his face. So you kind of know where this is going already. <laughs> Apparently, before they left home, she had left her bag beside the car in their garage, assuming that he would pack it, but he never saw it. At this point, she pretty much fell apart. This poor woman was checking into the one of the most expensive places on the planet with nothing but the clothes on her back. As the doorman and I tried to figure out what to do to make this couple happy, one of the staff, who had been there a lot longer than me, drove up to the front of the inn in the company car. I looked at him oddly. He just smiled and said, get me their keys and the address. I'll be back before dinner. I was floored. No one asked him to do this, and there wasn't a moment's hesitation on his part. He was so much a part of the service culture that he just knew the exact right thing to do. He was halfway to Pittsburgh before the lady actually believed that we were really going to get the luggage from her house. He drove eight hours round trip straight and made it back before their dinner reservations at nine. Okay, now, for some of you, Set aside the horror of the thought of a complete stranger going into your house while you're four hours from home, right? Okay, some of you never got past that point, okay? So let's just, let's acknowledge that is a little creepy uh, and just focus on the principle at play. Let, let it sink in. The answer is yes, now what's the question? It, it's, a, it's, a way, it's a way to say, we're going to find yes at all costs. No matter the personal sacrifice involved, no matter the inconvenience. And, and I think that that principle offers us an invitation as we draw this series to a close today. If you've been tracking with us the last several weeks, we're in the midst of this series we've been calling The Next Yes. And uh, we, we've looked at several instances where people's lives intersected with Jesus, and He invited them to follow Him and awaited their next yes. In some instances, it was their first yes, an initial decision to follow Jesus. We looked at one young man who, who offered Jesus a series of yeses. Do you follow the law? Yes. Do you believe these things? Yes. Will you sell what you have? Come and follow me. No. And we saw the way that one no can suddenly negate a series of yeses. Last week we looked together at a moment 
when sometimes the most significant yes follows our more tragic no's as Peter denied Jesus on the night of his arrest only to find Jesus on the seashore once again inviting him, Peter, come, follow me. So we draw this series to a close today. And what we've seen over and over again throughout this series, we keep bumping into this big idea. If you're following along in the YouVersion app, you can find it in the events tab, all the notes for today, all the scripture will be there. If it's helpful to write things down and fill in the blanks, I invite you to do that. Because we keep bumping into this big idea throughout this series. We've seen it week in and week out, that even though we often make it harder than this, we make it more complex than this. Following the will of God for your life is often as simple as finding the next yes. What is that thing that God would invite you to do? Where would Jesus invite you to follow next? Saying yes to that is the next thing that he would invite you to. And so we make following the will of God a lot more difficult than that. But most of the time, what it comes down to are these moments where Jesus is inviting us to take another step, to follow him in a new direction, and he's awaiting our next yes. Often, following the will of God is as simple as finding that next yes. So today, as we kind of bring this conversation to a close, I want us to begin to process what might happen in your pursuit of faith. What might happen as you strive to follow the ways and words of Jesus if you came to a point of offering Him your automatic yes? That, that wherever God would lead you, whatever He would invite you to do, the answer is yes. Now what's the question? And, and to, to do that, I want to invite us today not to look into the life of someone who encountered Jesus, not into one of the, the lives of one of the disciples. We've spent a lot of time with Simon Peter over the last few weeks together. Uh, but, but to get at this automatic yes, I want to invite us to look into a moment in the life of the master himself. Uh, to, to look into a moment in the life of Jesus that puts on display for us a heart yielded to the automatic yes. Because for 2,000 years, Christian faith has attested to the fact that Jesus was not simply fully God in the flesh. He was fully human, just like you and I. As the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament, the way he puts it is that, that he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And so what does it look like if, if we were to explore a moment in Jesus' life where he had to contend with his human will? He had to contend with his own desires, with his own preferred outcomes in comparison with what he knew the Father had prepared for him. What might happen? If in those moments for us, we began to learn to mirror the heart, the attitude, the actions of Jesus himself when he comes face to face with his own desires, his own urges, his own temptations. I want to invite us together to Matthew chapter 26 today. If you've got a Bible, you can open to Matthew 26, click on a device. If that's easier for you, this will also be on the screen for you to follow along. Matthew chapter 26, we're going to begin reading together in verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. 
Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. But when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. In the moments just before this, Jesus had gathered with his disciples in an upper room. And he gathered them specifically so that they could share together in the Passover feast. It was a a meal that, that celebrated what we sang about a few minutes ago, God leading his people out of slavery in Egypt. It commemorated for all time that he was their God. They were his people. He had saved them. He had rescued them. And at that meal, Jesus begins to recast the elements of the Passover meal in terms of his own impending death on the cross. That connection will make more sense to the disciples after Easter. But in this moment, he begins laying a foundation of taking this tradition and infusing it with new meaning as God once more is stepping into history to save and redeem his people. And it was while they were there in the upper room celebrating the Passover meal together that Jesus told the disciples that one of them, one of the twelve, would betray him into the hands of his opponents. And in that scene we looked at last week, it was there in the upper room celebrating the Passover that despite Peter's protest that, Jesus, I will go with you even unto death, even if everyone else abandons you. It was there in that moment Jesus told Peter, tonight you will deny me three times. And no doubt as their heads are spinning, they're trying to process a lot. Sometimes we forget that because had 2,000 years to reflect on these things. The disciples are getting this all in the moment. And their heads, no doubt, are spinning with a lot of information that doesn't make sense. One of them will betray him. Peter's going to deny him. In the midst of that, Jesus invites them to a place on the Mount of Olives called Gethsemane. And it's there, in this garden, that we see a side of Jesus we have rarely seen in Matthew's gospel up to this point. We we see there a a side of, of Jesus where he is downcast, where he he is heavy, his emotions are near the surface. The way he describes it to the men with him is my soul is sorrowful even unto death. This is a deeply, deeply emotional moment for Jesus. Filled no doubt with doubts, with fears, and with temptations. And so he asks his disciples to keep watch. But not before inviting Peter, James, and John to go with him a little further. And he leaves them there, instructing that they they keep watch with him. I'm not sure what they're watching for at this point. Jesus knows. There, There are others who will be coming to the garden to arrest him, to begin the 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 chain of events that will lead to his crucifixion. Jesus asks him to watch and goes a little further and falls on his face to pray says, my father. He, he, he begins with, with this note of relational intimacy with the God of Israel. The, the, the God who delivered his people from slavery is the God who Jesus knows as father. He calls out to his father and says, if it is 
possible. Let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Jesus returns to the disciples and finds them sleeping. He rouses them. Could could you not watch with me even an hour? And then Jesus says something I think is really telling. He says, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And I think in that moment, he's not simply describing their sleepiness, like, hey guys, I know you mean to do better. He's wrestling with the reality before him. I know what awaits. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Watch and pray. Think about this for... Jesus, in this moment, is essentially asking his disciples to pray that he will be strengthened to do the will of the Father. And they fall back asleep. Jesus goes and prays a second time. And Matthew tells us the the content of that prayer. It's a little bit different. It's on the surface, it sounds very much the same. But if if you look at the two side by side, there seems to be a little bit of progress. Because the second time, instead of praying and asking, Father, take this cup from me, Jesus acknowledges and says, if it cannot be taken from me, your will be done. Right, so, so, so Jesus in this moment wrestling with the complexities of everything this night entails begins to move his spirit beyond just simply willing, but ready. Ready to offer his yes to the will of the Father. And in that, he acknowledges that he must drink it. And and he shows a resolve that he not only knows the will of God, but he's willing to say yes. He returns again to the disciples and finds them again asleep. But time is growing short now, and so Jesus leaves them be and goes and prays a third time, and Matthew tells us he prays the same thing again. In other words, Jesus is kind of doubling down on his commitment at this point. He's wrestled through the desires within him to do something else and returns to prayer to say, but if it has to be this way, your will be done. And if you know the story of Jesus, you're familiar with what comes next. Jesus will be arrested. He'll face a hurried trial. Hours of scourging, torture, physical suffering before being stretched out on a cross where the one and only Son of God dies for the sin of the world. We know what comes next. What's more, Jesus knew what came next. In fact, if we'd been paying attention to Matthew's telling of Jesus' life, we probably could have begun to piece it together because all the way back at the beginning of the gospel, Joseph, betrothed to Jesus' mother Mary, is approached in a vision by an angel who says Mary will be with child conceived of the Holy Spirit. And he tells Matthew, or he tells Joseph rather, you will name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus' name, it, it, it derives from, from, from the, the Hebrew name Joshua, which, which essentially means Yahweh saves. 
the whole of Jesus' life and what the New Testament will go on to tell us from before the foundation of the world, everything has been leading to this moment. And yet Jesus, fully the Son of God made flesh, in His humanity, is conflicted. He, he longs to do the will of the Father, but He knows it will be costly. He knows He must deny Himself. Never before in Matthew's Gospel has the prayer that Jesus taught His disciples seemed so fitting for the Master Himself. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. But those words follow others. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I think our temptation in this moment of Jesus' temptation is to see Him as the Son of God and leave His humanity and His free will out of the equation. But Jesus' prayer, this moment in Gethsemane, won't let us do that. Because Jesus falls to his face and prays to his Father, not my will but yours be done. Those words acknowledge that there is a gap, that there is a difference between his desire, what he would prefer in this moment, and what he knows the Father has prepared for him. Just as much, it acknowledges that there is a commitment to and a confidence that God's will and God's way is best even when we can't see it in the moment. Right? The, the prayer that Jesus prays tells us He and the Father have different desires in this moment. And we struggle to wrap our minds around that. But his prayer tells us that Jesus has a confidence that the Father's will is best. And guys, I want you to know, if you are serious about following the ways and words of Jesus, following God's will will bring us to these moments where saying yes to God's best will mean we have to say no to what we want, to what we desire most. That we have to say no to self, no to my will, no to the impulse to sin. I would put it this way for us, it's there in the notes if you want to jot it down. Saying no to sin and self enables the automatic yes of holy surrender. When we come to these moments and we will say no to sin and to ourself, that is enabling us to move to this automatic yes of holy surrender. The incredible thing about, the, the, about having four Gospels in the New Testament is that we get four perspectives from which to understand Jesus. I want us to look together in light of what we've just seen in Matthew in the way that John in his Gospel describes the moments that happen immediately after Jesus' prayer. In John chapter 18, if you want to turn there, this will be on the screen for you again. John chapter 18, we're going to pick it up in verse 3. So Judas came to the grove guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. 
When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Let's pause for a second, because what we looked at last week, sometimes it's easy to give Peter a bad rap. It seems like in this moment, he's all in, right? He's ready to follow Jesus to death. He's swinging a sword. Verse 11, though, check this out. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Put away your sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has prepared for me? John gives us a perspective here of Jesus at the moment of his arrest where he is unwavering in his commitment to the Father's will. And if we're reading John's gospel, we come to that and we go, wow, how could he do that? And we just assume, because this is what we do when we read about Jesus and it seems impossible, we go, oh, he pushed the God button. <laughs> That's it. That... But when we, when we look at this moment with the full insight of all of the Gospels together, and we say, how did Jesus face this moment with an unwavering commitment to the will of His Father? It's because of the anguish in the garden. <laughs> It's because in those moments of prayer, Jesus had resolved to follow. He had already worked it out in his spirit. And he had come to a point of an automatic yes. Father, yes is the answer. Now what's the question? And we say, how? Saying no to sin and to self will enable the automatic yes of holy surrender. (laughs) This automatic yes, this yes, Lord, is the answer. What's the question? You know what we used to call that? In our movement of the church, we used to call that holiness. Where, where, where we say, I'm going to decide ahead of time that whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is right, that is my choice. That is where I will plant my feet. That is where I will stand. Lord, the answer is yes. What's the question? Because he, here, here's what we got to get, guys. If we wait until the moment where we are facing temptation to decide we will say yes to God's best, it is a whole lot easier to say no. It is a whole lot easier for Jesus to say yes as they come to arrest Him because He already said yes in the anguish of the garden. And if we wait until these moments where we're facing the decision, will I do the right thing, will I not? Will I follow where God leads, will I not? If we wait until those moments, it's a whole lot easier to convince ourselves it's okay to say no. To to reject what we know to be God's best. But the automatic yes determines that we will say yes to God and His best no matter what. I invite the band to come back. Because the reality is we, we all face temptation at every turn. I don't know about y'all, but, but I live every day in the midst of a broken world where things are not as they should be, 
where there's a whole lot of folks that don't really care whether I do what is in line with God's best or not. Opportunity to sin is never in short supply. We will all face temptation, a barrage of them all of the time. Will I, will I fudge the numbers at work just to make it work? Will, will I pass off a half-truth in an effort to manipulate people because what I said wasn't really wrong? Will I, will I put God first in my relationships and with my resources? Will I be faithful to my spouse in thought, in word, and in action? you're not married, will you guard yourself for a future spouse? Will, will I do everything I can to safeguard my character and my integrity? Will I decide I will not trade what I want now for what I want most? Here's the thing, we can face all of those temptations as they come. Or you can decide now to devote yourself to God's best no matter what. You, you can face them as they come one by one and every day is a renewed struggle. Or you can purpose in yourself with the Spirit being your helper that you will say yes to God's best no matter what, which means saying no to sin, saying no to self. That's what enables this automatic yes of holy surrender. Here in just a moment, we're going to pray and we're going to conclude our, our time of worship together today by sharing in the Lord's Supper that 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 reapplication of the Passover meal that Jesus gave us. A moment when we unite ourselves with believers around the world and across the centuries. It's a reminder that Jesus' yes is what makes all of our yeses possible. And so as we do that today, here's the invitation I want to make to you. Maybe you're in a position where you need to offer Jesus your first yes. You, you need to let what he did on the cross count for you personally. Acknowledge before God that you have said no to his best and that you want to say yes. Asking him to forgive your sin by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit to begin to transform you to the image of Jesus. Maybe you've already done that, but there's this, this nagging thing that you say, man, I know, I know that Jesus is inviting me to another yes, and I need to say it. Maybe today's a day where you need to take a step back and say, no, no, I'm done fighting the battle day in and day out. It's time to offer him my automatic yes. To say, Lord, the answer is yes. What's the question? I want your best no matter what. And here, here's, here's what, I, what I know to be true. As we surrender more and more of ourselves to God, he will reveal more and more of himself to us. And he will walk with us, transforming us into the image of Jesus. So whether today is a day you need to offer him your first yes, your next yes, or your automatic yes, as we come to the table of the Lord today, right where you are, would you, would you pray and give him that yes? Let me pray for us.